Before we jump into today's episode with Chris, we got to thank our sponsors. You guys have heard me talk about them before, paintyourlife.com. Hey, look, Christmas is going to look a little different for me this year. I'm actually going to be moving out of my apartment, moving back into the RV, and that RV life will continue probably for a month or two before I get my new house, and I'm super excited about that. Anyways, all of that to say... I don't know if our family will get to be able to be together for the holidays. It's going to be hard to kind of pack everybody into the RV, right? So I was thinking about ways to bring our family together safely, and I was thinking a hand-painted portrait would be perfect. And what's really cool is I actually stumbled across a bunch of photos that were in a box in my closet. I'm sure we all have one of those, stuffed with all kind of stuff. And I found these photos of my grandparents and my parents that were just super old. Some of them were black and white, and I was thinking, man, how cool would it be if I could take these photos and have them turn into a painting, I think that would make the most special gift. If you've not heard me talk about paintyourlife.com before, first of all, they're awesome. Second of all, they support the Team Never Quit podcast, which is amazing. But what they do is they will take a photo that you have. It can be of whatever, your children, your family, a special place, pet, and they will turn it into a hand-painted portrait and they do it for a really affordable price. You guys have probably heard me say before, they took a photo of my dogs, Tank, Kona, Golden Retrievers, they were on the bed, they took the bed out, they put blue bonnets in the background, they turned it into a painting, and it was incredible. You can order a custom-made, hand-painted portrait in less than five minutes on their website. It really is a quick and easy process. You can get a hand-painted portrait in about three weeks, and I promise you, it's going to make the most perfect holiday gift for someone you love, or hey, might even be a great gift for yourself, all right? You guys know our sponsors always do an amazing, great job taking care of you guys, our listeners, and there's no exception today. At paintyourlife.com, there's no risk. And right now, as a limited time offer, they're gonna give you guys 20% off your painting. So if you've been thinking about what to get for someone for, for the holidays, for Christmas, don't look any further. Paintyourlife.com, this is it. They're gonna give you guys 20% off. They're gonna cover the shipping. It's 100% free for shipping. To get this special offer, all you guys have to do is text the word TNQP, to 64,000, that's TNQP to 64,000, text TNQP to 64,000, paint your life, celebrate the moments that matter most. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Team Never Quit Podcast. We're doing this every Wednesday, you know, because you download the podcast. Hey, if you haven't already, make sure you click on the notification bell on YouTube, subscribe to be notified every time we drop a new video. And uh, we've got a Patreon question, because that's how we kick these things off, right? Patreon question comes from Glenn. He says, given the chance, would you go to Mars, or would you go back in time to meet a hero or famous person, and why? I would go back in time, because anyone going to Mars isn't coming back. And the people who create rockets that'll get you there, none of those motherfuckers ever get in the rocket. They're always behind the concrete bunker with their fucking eyes closed and their fingers in their ears. They're not even going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to second when he said, yeah. I'm going to go back and meet somebody. Do we? Who is the somebody? Do you know who your somebody would be? Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I it's do. a toss up for me because I like, do you go back and hang out with Steve Jobs and say, hey, man, you might want to get screened for cancer and quit eating fruit nonstop and be a part of that? thing might be one of the guys in the fucking garage hanging out with him and so your life's different forever or is it tombstone and you're hanging out with doc holiday gunfighting in the street like uh, that's my toss-up i'm like man do i chill in silicon valley with the nerds or do i get dirty and nasty but you know you're out in the fucking desert on a horse and that kind of sucks the only cool part about it is you're hanging out with doc holiday and shooting dudes you know yeah i was gonna go with like meeting like Raquel Welch or some smoking hot. I'd go back chick. and meet Marcus Luttrell. <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> I yeah, I, I would want to meet Marcus. Barely, I, would, yeah. I would want to meet Marcus Luttrell's brother. Yeah. As a what kid. do you mean? That's that a badass. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Morgan Luttrell, but uh he's a he, it's a thing. It's a yeah, thing. It's a thing. He's a guy. I don't know. He gives me so much grief. This is the funniest thing because our whole life everybody always I was always called Morgan. I never That's got bored. been out of shape about it. Not that I wouldn't call Marcus. Well, like why he wasn't standing there I don't see how anybody can confuse the two both seals twins tatted up that's weird both in Texas yeah. that was his fault I don't understand how you guys he started the whole thing you don't thing. even look alike yeah you don't even look alike it's ridiculous I know the tattoo it's right? oh, yeah. his older brother like I said man he's kind of like right now he's looking down at me yeah through he's me looking down through me like I feel like I've been talking too much I don't even look like, at these spiteful like, eyes he gives me this like shut up little brother you know what the hell you're what are you doing like it's all <laughs> alright Marcus who me. do you want to meet Jesus. 
Isn't that the number one answer? No. That totally ruins the mode, though, because everyone's yeah. like, man, I would want to go meet, meet this chick. Like, oh, <laughs> man. Yeah, I, guess I feel me, bad. Me, <laughs> me saying, gonna... so somebody did that to us one time. We were all saying, somebody brought that up, we were, and we were going over it, and then they threw that out, and it was just kind of like everybody got kind of, Oh, right, yeah. Oh, you yeah, like, no, go no, back no. and hang out with John Wayne or Clint Eastwood when he was young. Yeah, we kind of know how that one ends, right? You know what I mean? It's just like, eh. And Marcus throws Jesus out. No, it was, yeah. dude, it was funny. And what are you going to do? Be the guy that it's tells the Romans, funny. hey, don't do this. You guys are making a huge mistake. Yeah, you're making a mistake. You guys don't you're going to fall because of it. Yeah. That's hilarious. Money well, on the Saints. Glenn, thanks for your question. Did if we, you want to ask a question for Patreon, patreon.com slash team never quit. We got an awesome guest in store. Chris Osmond, Marine, Navy SEAL. Instagram meme god somehow that happened entrepreneur Chris performed in numerous classified operations in the Arabian Gulf he said classified classified he's classified classified are you Joe Biden speechwriter by chance I think so okay I mean hey what do I do? gotta make money doing something I don't something. know what to do with my hands come on man <laughs> while on active duty he founded his first ever company tactical assault gear he sold the business in 2010 and in 2019 he founded rugged a tactical nylon weapons training and an ammunition company chris what up man welcome to the show thanks for having me guys pleasure to be on he was in like Texas. he was like an entrepreneur welcome to the motherland thank you yeah i remember because the first time first night and this you, you actually andrew you brought this you, this up I, and i totally forgot i misplaced the high we had met but i was a bud student mm -hmm. and bro bro and i came down to your shop and uh Bought matching knives. So did you own the shop while you were still in the teams? I did, yeah. So I started it in 2001. I was active duty and, you know, I was just a gear nerd. I don't know how I fell into that, but... You were a good some, one too, though. I mean, you're... I was, yeah, I don't know what it was about gear, the nylon. And it was something that just spoke to me and I just... Talks to you, calls to us, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it was, man. And then I just started thinking to myself, oh, man, I wish this pouch did this. I wish his backpack did that. And that you were was like, it. Were you... As far as I remember, you were the first on the West Coast. I was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Were you a rigger? No. I can't sew worth a fuck. People think I make this stuff, and they're like, oh, yeah, Chris made. I'm like, no, Chris designed. There are hundreds of people that make this shit, not me, back then, you know what I mean? And, yeah, yeah. you know, but, and you guys, obviously, everybody knows Blackhawk, right? And so I was just gear geeking out and shit, and one time a guy was like, hey, why don't you just become a Blackhawk dealer? I was like, what the fuck is that? He's like, yeah, man, call Mike Noel, man. Here's his cell phone number. And a uh, dude named Dan Tabor actually gave me his cell phone yeah. number because he served them out at, at Team 8. I just called him up and he's like, hey, man, what's going on? I was like, yeah, I want to be a, a Blackhawk dealer. <laughs> he's like, cool. Well, uh, you know, you got to have a business license. And I was like, a what? So I literally did not know shit about <laughs> business. And Mike Knowles on the phone telling me, yeah, you got to get a business license and, and a resale certificate. You don't know anything about this? And I'm like, no. He's like, look, do a little research. Come back to me. But I'll sort you out. And then... Um, my first opening order for getting a dealership with Blackhawk was me going around like platoon space to platoon space with the catalog asking guys. I lied to him and told him I was already a dealer. I was like, hey, do you guys want to buy some <laughs> nice shit from me? Of course you did. And then I got like $2,000 in orders and I'd go, hey man, here's my opening order. And it was all their shit. And that's how it all started. Yeah. It's brilliant. Hey man, whatever you got. Hey. Yeah. I, it's about how I got through college. Yeah. That's how Taylor got in NASCAR. He just jumped in <laughs> like right a in cold there. trickle, cold trickle, and never let his foot off the gas. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. I can just drive the car. I watched ESPN. They have great coverage. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah, no shit. There I was. So yeah. take us back, Chris. How did you get your start? Did you start in the Marines or the SEALs? Started in the Marine Corps. Uh, I grew up in San Diego, and I grew up in a place called Southeast San Diego, which they now renamed because it's not politically correct, I guess, because of all the the gangs and the violence and the bullshit. My dad was in the Navy. He was a uh, command master chief on uh, fast attack submarines during the Cold War. So he was, oh, a, he was a cob. Yeah, he was a cob. You guys know that mm, well from yeah. being an SDG. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Hardest job in the Navy. So he did that for most of his career. Uh, and, you know, obviously typical Navy family, San Diego. And we lived out in southeast San Diego. They built these new, like, housing um, communities. But they were low-income housing that were supposed to be for the low-income black communities. But my parents got a loan and moved out there. Now, this is in the early 80s, so probably like 84 when we moved in. I was like fourth grade, something like that. But that's when interest rates were through the roof for housing. It was like, I think their mortgage was 12 and a half or 13% back Damn. then. Now it's 2.5, 2.8, something like that. But that was, you know, and they were, they, they were happy that they got it at 12. I remember that my mom being excited that she's like, oh my God, thank God we got it at like 12%. Because people were at 17% interest rates for mortgages. 
In California, man. Yeah, it was insane. Y'all got problems. So we move in, and I did not know what a gang member was. I did not know what a blood, a crip, nothing like that. I had no vernacular in that world. And next thing you know, going to school, and I'm just like, people are throwing up gang signs. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm in fourth grade. What the fuck are you guys talking about? Like, what's that you claim? I'm like, uh, lunch? I don't know. When, when the fuck is lunch? So it's just very weird growing up around that, being a white kid, and you're like surrounded in this area. And I grew up on a famous street that's out there. There's a Skyline Drive, and there's Morris High School, which is on Skyline Drive. I went to Fulton Elementary, which is next door. And then the rival school slash gang was the Lincoln Park Bloods. And if you get even they even make gangland episodes about it where, you know, Mitchie Slick is one of the the rappers, the famous rappers that came out of there. But that's the shit that I grew up around. Those are the guys that I grew up, you know, went to school with their brothers and, and all that. And, you know, that's where my street smarts and no bullshit I think attitude really came from because I was pretty chill up into that point. And then when I started getting the shit beat out of me just for being a white kid, that's when I started taking martial arts and you know, then when somebody would just say something negative, we just throw in hands and that's kind of like how it was but I always knew I wanted to be in the military because my dad was in the military and I wanted to be in the Marine Corps and then a buddy of mine his name's Chris Rabana he's actually the command master chief for the second Marine Division now he's getting ready I think he's got three years before he retires like 28 years or 30 years in some shit like that but and he was like yeah you don't want to do that man you want to be Navy SEAL and I was like what the fuck is that and he's like dude they dive in the water they blow shit up and then that was it he, he's the one that convinced me to join the Navy to be a SEAL. I did not even know the SEAL teams had a special force. My dad never talked about it. And the whole time I grew up, I was Navy SEAL, Navy SEAL, Navy SEAL. And he never really, they supported it obviously and bought me the shirts and the UDT shorts. And I ran around with the fucking Navy SEAL hat on and I did all the gay shit, but, oh, that's not, it's not a political guy, but it was gay as fuck. And, <laughs> but I still was just me. And so I just got into a lot of fights and got into a lot of trouble and kind of like lost my way so I had a criminal record and I had drug use. So I go to join the Navy and I'm like, you know, when the guy looks at you and he's like, have you ever tried a drug? And I'm like, yeah, man, sure have. And he's just like, oh yeah. <laughs> Puts his like pen down, takes me aside. He's like, you stupid motherfucker. I was like, that's not the moment of truth. I thought that was, you know, you're supposed to like come clean and right. begin yeah, a new. In the trust, in the tree, in the, in the, tree, the nest. The yeah. Tree. Yeah. And he's like, what do you think? Just the French foreign legion. You're going to start your life over. What the fuck's wrong with you? He's like, dude. He's like, now you can't go to Bud's. You got to join the Navy for four years. So I went and talked to my dad about it. And he's like, man, I don't know, dude. I don't think you're meant for the regular fleet Navy. <clears throat> so I went back to the recruiter. And then he suggested I join the Marine Corps. And I thought he was out of his mind because I grew up in a Navy family. And I, you know, wanted this my whole life. But obviously didn't want it enough because I was doing drugs and beating dudes up and getting in trouble. So, you know, I just went in to talk to the Marine recruiter. And it was the same four years. That was the the argument. It was like, Hey man, you can be in the Marine Corps for four years and then get out, join the Navy and go to buds. Or you can be in the fleet Navy for four years and you'll never go to buds. And that was kind of the, the pitch my Navy recruiter gave me. And so that was it, man. That literally that day I, I joined the Marine Corps and three, I want to say less than a week later, I was, I was in boot camp, getting screamed at by a black drill instructor, scaring the living fuck out of me. And I was like, Whoa, wait, man. Woo. right there in San Diego too. right? Yeah. At MCRD. Yeah. MCRD. Yeah. What did you do in the Marines? Artillery. Okay. Yeah. Where? Camp Pendleton. Oh, you still you're at Pendleton? Yeah. Yeah. I, I put, I mean, I filled every, you know, you filled the dream sheet where you want to go. And I was like, I don't want to be in California. I grew up here. And so they put you in California, right? Yep. Yeah. California. <laughs> then I went to the SEAL teams. You're like, hey, man, you ever thought about staying in San Diego? <laughs> <laughs> so I never left. I was there for 44 years yeah. until we. That's the problem. Moved I think Vegas. about it every day. Yeah. That's yeah. funny. Shit, man. Did you get uh, discharged from the Marine Corps or did you just lat transfer? No, I had to be discharged from the Marine Corps. Okay. And, and then after that, we, you had to go back to a recruiter? So I was, I went to a recruiter about six months before I got out and asked him if it was possible to leave the Marine Corps and join the Navy and go to BUDS. He said, yep, man, absolutely. I know how to do it. So I had to re-enter the services like a kid out of high school. So I took the ASVAB again. I did all the paperwork again. Really? Yeah. And then I had, and then I had a buddy of mine that was over at First Force Recon. So I went over to their uh, base and they gave me a dive physical right out of their dive locker as my exit physical for the Marine Corps. And I used that dive physical yeah. to qual to get into buds. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. So from the time I left, actually, I left the Marine Corps and joined the Navy the same day. So I literally turned in my ID card and got my discharge papers at like 9 a.m. And had got in my car and drove down to MEPS in San Diego. And I was sworn in at 
at one o'clock in the afternoon. Did you go straight to Bud's? Because you didn't have to go through boot camp as a Marine, did you? No. And I and I picked uh, Bosun's mate because it's the only school that has no, or it's the only rate that has no school. And so I just got orders and it just said Naval Special Warfare Guaranteed. That's all that was on my contract. And that they, the Navy guaranteed me orders to Bud's. And so about, I'm going to say like four or five weeks later, I was there, man, head shaved and getting after it. Jamming it. Head the shaved, whole, head for the grave. The whole time you were in the Marines, were you working to go back to be a Navy SEAL since that was your first vision or did it kind of just happen? By no, I mean, I, I could not shake the special operations stuff. So I read all the books about SAS, SBS. I mean, I was reading shit about units that most people never even heard about. Just I could not shake wanting to be specialized and wanting to test myself that much or to be tested and just see if I could even do it. And so, and then I thought I was a bad motherfucker, right? You're like, dude, I'm a Marine combat vet. Like how hard can it really be? And I got down there and found out exactly how hard it is <laughs> and i can assure anybody listening that it is a thousand times harder than anything that you will do in the marine corps unless you look go to like marsoc or you know force recon or something like or recon and, and go to brc or something like that then you're but just you know people try to compare it all the time to like marine corps boot camp but you know the marine corps graduates thirty thousand people a year buds graduates 250 mm -hmm. you know so that's a military math though you know yeah it's like Green Berets, right? People, I mean, they're, we all know Special Forces guys that have killed more people than cancer and they're bad people, you know, on the, on the battlefield. But as far as the selection process, I mean, currently right now, there's more active duty and Green Berets in the National Guard than there have been SEALs that graduated BUD since 1943. So, yeah, it's the water. It's a math thing. Yeah. Yeah. They don't like the water. Nobody likes the water. I know. We don't even like the water. No. I wouldn't go through buds right now in a fucking dry suit. I'd be like, oh my God, my hands and my face are going to get wet. Nah, I'm good. So yeah, so then there I am, buds. I started with 213 and got injured with I tried buds, the tibial band injury. Was rolled for four months and then classed back up with uh, 215 for second and third phase and finished up. So I was in buds for 10 months, just like you. Taylor, how many, how failed, ta ta Taylor failed pool comp seven times. How many, how many times did you? I failed pool comp three times and passed on my fourth try. Yeah, I was on that whaling wall three times. Yeah. That's a miserable place to be. Because you know how it is, man. You're sitting there with the twin 80s on your back, fucking weight belt on. It sucks so UDTs. bad. I mean, whoever came up with that? Yeah. Do we even know? We need to find them. Yeah. you're, <laughs> and, and you're just sitting there dude, shivering, like, staring, you staring at the that? wall, and it's just Loserville, man. You're absolutely parked I, in Loserville. I, I, I filled my first bull comp, and, and Ryan Zinke, the Secretary of Interior, who was the XO buds at the time, came up and kicked me in the back. I mean, I looked up at him. He's like, hey, Latrell, it's cool, man. Not everybody's meant to be a SEAL. Yeah. And he walked off. Jesus. That's not <laughs> That's very just what I needed to hear. <laughs> That's not very motivating. Cut <laughs> your throat. Yeah. Like, I appreciate yeah. that, but I really don't have a choice. I got I to gotta, I gotta do this. Yeah. But it's interesting. I, I think back of all that time and the, the inner service rivalry stuff and the shit talking and, like, what's hard is And then we, you know, we've all been to combat now and war and, and worked with almost every damn unit that there is. And we're all kind of the same. It's just the different selection process you pick and choose and, you know. And I think that's what makes it so much fun. Whether it's yeah. when we get around, because if we were all on the same line, same thing, we, you know, there'd be a lot, I think there'd be a lot more distance between us, actually. It's in the beginning after, and especially what we got into the war, we had to fight. We, we couldn't see our enemy. We could see each other, though, fighting it. Right. We'd always have to, when we started integrating, that was the best part, because I'm a, I'm a bastard, too. I'm an 18 Delta, so it does. When you weren't you, a Delta, it, were you? No. Your boss was made the whole time? Yeah. Were you still in when they crossed over, cross raided? No, I was just getting out. What about you? You were just SO all the way across. Yeah. Well, aren't you cool? Simple. <laughs> were, you, were you in the SEALs 9-11? I was. So I was actually in, I was going through Marine Corps Scout Sniper School at Camp Pendleton two days before, oh no, two days before graduation was 9-11. <clears throat> and I came strolling into the classroom and one of the instructors asked me, he's like, hey man, do you see what's going on with the terrorists have hijacked planes and they're crashing them into the buildings? And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? And then- What the, graduation was this? I'm sorry. This was two days before Marine Corps Scout Sniper graduation. Oh, okay, right, right. Because I was, I'd already done one platoon and then I was, um, you know, it's like, you know, back in the day, it was like, hey man, do you want to go to sniper school or do you want to go to free fall? You kind of had to pick. Right. And so I picked going to sniper school because at that point I'd never seen anybody free fall into anything like <laughs> even, <laughs> even in training it was like uh we're just gonna do a duck in the water or yeah. we're gonna have the boat guys take us and you know so i didn't even think you know what's the fucking point so 
I'd rather have a capability that I believe that might lend me, you know, you know, an opportunity. It lend me an opportunity <laughs> downrange as opposed to, hey man, I'm free fall qualified, and you're like, cool, we're, we're walking or we're driving. <laughs> That'd be great. We're on the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stand by. <laughs> stand by. Stand by. <laughs> like, okay. So, um, what was funny story is the the phone rings in the the quarter deck of the office there for the instructors, the Marines, and they answer, and they walk into the classroom. They're like, hey, Osman, you got a phone call, and I jump on the phone. They're like, I'm like, how can I help you? They're like, you've been recalled. You got to get back to the team. I'm like, okay. Hung the phone up. And I was like, hey guys, sorry, I got to go. And just started packing all my shit to leave. And they were freaking out. They're like, you can't do that, man. You need orders to leave. You just, you have to turn in your barracks key. You got to be signed off for your room and turn in your linens. And I'm like, guys, bye. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Bye-bye. <laughs> they were giving me a bunch of shit. They wouldn't let me and my, my, my boy pack our shit. So I just called the command up and I was like, hey, can I speak to the XO real quick? I was like, gets on the phone, told him what was going on. He's like, who in the fuck is in charge down there? I was like, uh, gunnery sergeant, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, he's like, put that motherfucker on the phone. <laughs> and then you just hear him. You just hear this yelling. And then, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. So sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. And he hangs the phone up. He's like, have a great trip, guys. Can, and that, can, can I get your key? We'll take care of the bed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else we can do for you? Yeah. So, yeah, we left. And uh, six days later, we had palletized and we were out of there. So, really? Yeah. We were gone like six days after. First one's in, then, huh? Yeah. Oh, well, Team team 8 was already there because they were four deployed, and then we relieved Delta Platoon from Team 3. Yeah, it was three, right? Yeah. And then we we were we started doing ship takedowns, and we were all fucking I remember when that happened. When that started coming over the wires, it was like, oh. Yeah. I and mean, everybody was all pissed. But, you know, back in the day, before 9-11, and I call it Operation Enduring Training, but... <laughs> Because <laughs> you're just oh, that's good. You're just I'm, walking dude, around. Have you been sitting on that one for how long, man? <laughs> I want to uh, call it 14 years. I've I think never about heard oh. that. <laughs> yeah, ready. Was ready. That was so good. Oh yeah. my gosh. So you guys remember you just walk around. You're fucking. Of course we remember. Oh, yeah, and you're just God. sweating. You're sweating to the oldies. You're just like, man, I thought this looked a lot better Operation in those recruiting videos. This training. job God. fucking sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, so we, we were doing shape, ship takedowns before that. My first deployment, we were doing ship takedowns. We the only ones really doing anything. And then we, and we were like, oh, we we're all fired up because we're doing our frogman shit. But then after 9-11, we're like, ship takedowns, that's for pussies. We don't want to do any of that. We want to get in the fight. But there was no fight to be had. I mean, this is fucking literally weeks after 9-11. So we're out cruising around on the Mark 5s and we get, in a, you know, the, the XO from the mothership calls us and says there's a, a, a target to be taken down and it was alpha 117 which was the ship that al-qaeda used to smuggle the explosives into africa to blow up the two embassies and they were like hey guys look you have to do it because you know dev group is too far south they cannot make it it was actually supposed to be their target so like and they were just like i don't give a fuck what you do get on there and do what you guys do so we went on there and fucked those guys all up and beat them down and broke all their shit like <laughs> broke all everything we fucked that that we fucked that boat up it was pretty much no toilets no nothing we destroyed everything mm. and it was you know we were pretty hot i mean you think that because that went down less than a month after 9 11 and well yeah. that, that was the thing it's like we got hit over here kind of, and people opened up the door for us like when yeah. you guys yeah, we stepped in with a flak jacket from Vietnam. I remember that, but then right after that, that gear started rolling in. Yeah, I mean, you guys know. I mean, the ROEs are not like they are now. I mean, mm -hmm. those aren't even thing. You haven't talking about that. No, it was just like hey, we were developing the ROEs. Yeah, it was like if they're brown, they're down. You're like, what? What chief? He's like, yeah, man, he's yeah, military age male. He's got a gun. Just drop his ass. And you're like, okay, that's what we're doing now. <laughs> so strange times, you know. Very interesting times, but but what? Training, training, but cool. my business was already started by then. Because I had, you know, I just started it. It was only six or seven months old, and I left. And my my wife and my dad ran the business well, the whole time I was in Afghanistan. And then I came home to a thriving business because it was just a concept. It was an idea. You know, there was twenty grand worth of inventory in the store, and then I come home to you guys. Remember, man, packed full of shit and lines oh, out the door. Dude. People are scrambling to get gear and equipment. It was it was crazy. That was the thing. Because we were still deploying with that old stuff, and you had the new stuff right down the road. Yeah. Man, whatever. That's what I, because I had heard that. I was like, so you're like, you're a tailor for the whatever the team guys need. Like, mm -hmm. And 
so guys had actually designed that and gone and i mean that was the whole deal yeah i mean even having black gear for doing combat swimmer was it was new to, us. to paint that stuff yeah because there's nothing more time consuming waste of time fucking waste of your life than spray painting wet gear yeah it's good time <laughs> right because yeah. you're doing combat summer right and it's yeah. a month long you guys know the drill and your shit's still soaking wet and you're out there make sure your limpets are painted black the yeah. only thing that doesn't rust in salt water is put on face body. paint but we're under water shut the fuck up okay who okay. y'all chief who <laughs> y'all chief and you're trying to literally paint my eyeball yeah what what do you think made the business like thrive while you were gone was it you give a lot was, of credit to your wife and well, they were, I mean, they were obviously very dedicated and ran the business and showed up every day. And, you know, we were open up six days a week and, you know, they were relentless and keeping it alive. And, you know, so that was the real reason. And then also, obviously the, I call it the golden cruise box, but that's when all the money just started pouring in and guys, you know, platoons were just able to it buy whatever they wanted to. Proximity to that. Yeah. And the proximity to the command. I mean, he was, was an operator going over. Then. So it was like wearing, if you weren't an operator yet, an operator was wearing that gear. It was like his own gear locker. Yeah. That we could all had access to. Yeah. He yeah. was right at the end of the strand. So you could I mean, leave the team right during lunch. Freaking. Go grab whatever you go wanted. Grab, yeah, it's like, yeah. hey, look, we're doing, yeah, we're doing, like I said, we're doing combat swimmer. Everybody paint shit black. Or you can go down, you go down to tag and buy yourself a black yeah. rug. Or if you bust something, like if we, we break our gear all the time, it takes a long time for the stuff to come back, for it to come back around. That's yeah. why we get two of everything because we'll, they know that we're going to break something. Yeah. And, and then you got your one. Well, then if they got Because this- we don't have to operate in, under the constraints of conventional. Uh, military, we we can wear and utilize whatever we want. Like just really, can't. oh yeah, yeah. is yeah. it still that way? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What yeah. what is required? Like, is there like a certain like you have to wear you this up, this, kid. but anything else is well. You got to obviously got to have <laughs> your you know gun belt, pistol, magazines, couple of hand grenades, plate carrier, you know, six magazines. Got to have your navigation equipment, your helmet, but your you knives, any, all that any, shit. Any, but any type carrier. of other but stuff. You could, but if the command issues you say an eagle industry's plate carrier and you're like yeah man but i don't want that one i want the one from cry precision you could just go buy it and, and they didn't care yeah no oh, that's cool yeah. as long as you have the commands issued armor inside of it then they don't give a shit got it i think that's the only thing you had to wear was the plate they gave you yeah right yeah i mean you couldn't come to work wearing some crazy ass camis and shit like sure that. yeah but we i mean yeah. our camis were badass yeah we got the best of that won. stuff anyways yeah yeah yeah, if you if you tried to be like a Vietnam SEAL and roll in there with blue jeans on and a hoodie, you get the shit beat out yeah. of you. You got to because that's their thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah you gotta take it. Respective culture. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you got to modify what's been issued to you. Is if yes, yeah, that makes sense. makes any sense. Yeah, that's what makes each generation unique. That's how they because ours is a baseball cap with tattoos and freaking. So you said earlier you didn't have any idea what you were getting into when you started business. Just like oh, no, I business. literally I knew fucking nothing about business. I didn't even know you had to have a license to have a business. I knew nothing about taxes and corporations and lawyers and CPAs. I knew nothing about that stuff. Is that just something that kind of falling on your sword and just hoping and praying or. Well, I just learned as I as I went. Learned as you failed. <laughs> yeah, learned as I failed. Huge failures, many failures. Um, you know, I, I tell people all the time that because I ask about you know what's the hardest thing and you know buds and you know I'm like man for, fuck buds. Let's talk about being in business for almost two decades now and never not making payroll, never bouncing a check. You know, there were times where I cried myself to sleep, literally no bullshit, laying in bed crying, wondering how I was going to pay 100 people in two weeks, you know, because it grew from that little ass shop Mm -hmm. to a 23,000 square foot manufacturing facility. I had 110, 115 employees when I sold it. I mean, I'm a high school graduate, fucking E5 team guy walking in there. And that's as many guys that are in a SEAL SEAL command, you know, 120 dudes. I didn't know that you'd... When did that happen? When did you expand? That... Expansion happened in 2007, 2008 time okay. frame. I was, I was, I just left for the East Coast. Yeah, because at that point we were, I was making, or we, the company was averaging about 250 to 260 thousand Molly pouches a year, just in pouches. We were making a fuckload of kit. That was that was back before they issued the big the tan big bag. bag, yep. bag I was there. I was there. Up, Sat on the equipment review board. When they were dis- when they were coming up with that whole kit concept, and I had to leave or recuse myself, because I would you know back in the day, we had those equipment review boards at Trade It, and they would lay out all the gear and like, oh, this is the pouch everybody's going to use. This is the fin that we want to buy for everybody. This is the sunglasses. That's how all that comes, and that's how why we get it in supply because there are people who know shit nothing about gear picking it for us, which is why to this day we still go out and buy our own. So 
but I was already the gear geek. Everybody knew me that I had the shop down there. So I was at trade it by then. And they're like, Hey man, you're going to represent trade it and go sit on the <laughs> equipment review board. And I'm like, nah, man, fuck that company. They suck. And I'm just like bashing my competitors. <laughs> and they're like, Hey man, everything can't suck. And I'm like, guys, I, I can't sit in here. I, I, a I conflict of interest. It's here. a huge yeah. conflict of interest. Yeah. And that's what ended up forcing, I won't say forcing me. That's what ended up pushing me to leave because the new CO came to trade at the new XO, the command master chief, and they're down at, at supply getting issued gear with my label on it. And the CO was like, man, this is a nice rigors belt. We didn't get nothing like this back at team two, you know, where he came yeah. from. He's like, yeah, actually one of your, uh, your guys makes it. And then he's like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, there's a team guy here at trade it that you're now in charge of. That's his company. And you're wearing his shit. And then it was, it was pretty bad. Cause I had to go in there and explain cause it's conflict of interest again, because I know too much, right? I use it every day and I'm one of you guys. So I'm making shit that works for what we were doing. And that was just a massive, you know, conflict. So was Ashman still in the teams when his shit was going through? I think they just pulled him. I think he got out before it mm -hmm. for the Ashman chest seal. Yeah. When that came online, I was at 18 a couple of guys that invented the tourniquets. Like that's the best thing. When you throw a hodgepodge stuff to us and then we'll figure out a way to, <laughs> yeah. to make it work. And those are usually the best. Like with team guy in the gear issue, you just need to send it whatever team's doing that business. Like for the diving, why yeah. would they ask anybody other than us? Right. And the SDV is what you need to wear when you're in freaking water. <laughs> I mean, because there's all that stuff comes in and some of it's, yeah, you know, it's cool to look at and it works for a little bit, but then, you know, basics are basics. Yeah. I can't imagine you guys must have laughed your asses off at us. We're like, oh yeah, we're frogman, we're diving. And you're like, for what, an hour and a half? Oof, you guys must be stressed I, out. I gotta tell you, we ran into <laughs> a lot of, even, even guys across the street and there's just like, man, you guys don't piss somebody off or something sandwiches, man. Yeah. dude you guys are always underwater it's not we wouldn't laugh at y'all we wouldn't in order to do underwater. that you would have had to have a little bit of diving experience for us to laugh at compared to what we have to do and yeah but that's not just being underwater right people listening you're like oh yeah there we were underwater no you guys are <laughs> in we a fucking i mean you know, the back of that thing's about the size of a, a large refrigerator so there's four of you in a refrigerator with underwater gear. with gear for 14 hours yeah, yeah. On, on three rigs Pitch black, yeah. can't see nothing. I mean, it, the it's, death, it's, dude. it's the same thing as if you put me in a trunk of a car, right? But it held water. And filled it with ice water. And then drive around for freaking. But no, you put, <laughs> you put me on, you put me on car air instead of being on boat air, but I got the air. So it's never going to run out. They close the fucking lid and they drive from Virginia beach to Miami. And you're like, okay, you're getting out. And you're like, holy shit. And you're like, but now you, now the job starts. You you were, that was just the ride. Now you got to operate. Yeah. Yeah. And then do that again. Then get Thank back. God after you operate, then you got to get back in the trunk and, and that's drive how you got to get home. Yeah, yeah, you got to get home. That <laughs> You're way. like, guys, can we just walk? From and, here? Then when, and then when you get home, you got to, <laughs> yeah. Then you got to clean everything. Then you got to clean up your own <laughs> stuff. I was yeah. like, man, not, I hate talk. Now that you say it like that, I can't. Why do, that's that's some, real frogman shit. It's unbelievable. Being a <laughs> being a seal is being a seal, and then there's that element of diving. And of course, as the war kept growing bigger and bigger and bigger, combat summer just became a check in the box of like, hey man, make sure you can stay down at twenty feet couple get in the pool <laughs> get in the pool do a couple shots on the fucking pace line and then we're going to call that good and get you your 250 bucks yeah that was a funny thing demo call. I, we kept our draggers in our locker kept all that in our locker i like yeah. would walk out to the end of the pier still in your camis and jump in the this is how we had to practice jump in the water and then get dressed because yeah. we had to be able to dress under us in under 15 minutes yeah they would pitch black yeah so it's amazing what you can get done if you have to so us, for us regular guys what was the point of that trunk exercise per se right like having that many guys in a, such a small confined well it's the it's the vehicle right i mean they obviously they're the experts on it but it's a it's an insert and ex, extraction platform right and that's what makes it's it completely unexpected and undetectable undetectable yeah. so you have to just prep your body for that i don't there's know. no you have, to, you have to be willing to suffer. It's funny because every time we did it, it was, I was like, okay, maybe after we do this a thousand times, I'll be like, all right. And it's like, nah, say. <laughs> Just still <laughs> sucks. Freaking do it, man. But yeah. there's, you have to appreciate the, the theaters of conflict and how accessible they are by water if you kind of do the minimum yeah. on that. And that's why we did what we did. But anyway, back to Chris. Yeah. So walking around in the desert with a backpack on way fucking easier, which is why everybody <laughs> does it. So oh, shit. Yeah. I think the SEAL teams would be cut in half today. If you said, Hey man, it's mandatory that you have to do four years at SDB. Well, now you gotta be selected to go out there. Yeah. Half of us would be like, mm, 
Nah. Um, or you hit every team. You like rotate through every team. One, two, three, four, five. Count all the way up. Yeah. All right, guys. Let's talk about one of our sponsors real quick, okay? Because you guys know they're who help us put this show together every week. And today, we've got a brand new supporter of the show, Fight Camp. Oh, guys. If y'all have not heard of Fight Camp, you guys are about to be pumped, all right? For me, at least, not all workouts are that exciting, all right? But there's nothing more exciting and engaged in the learning boxing, kickboxing. And that's exactly why people are saying that Fight Camp is the only workout they've stuck with. So if maybe if you've been struggling to find a workout routine that you like, listen, Fight Camp provides boxing, kickboxing workouts and tutorials that keep you engaged, learning, excited, most importantly, motivated. You know, you got to stay in it, all right? Fight Camp brings the boxing gym to your living room with a tech twist, all right? They provide all the gear. They've got some top trainers with a new technology that actually tracks your punches. Everything you're going to need to get a great workout in. It's made for absolute beginners to experienced boxers who want to box from home. Fight Camp is a great way to learn boxing and kickboxing. You can improve your fitness with authentic workouts all while learning at your own pace in the compounds of your home, right? Maybe your gym's closed. Maybe you can't get out there. You can do this workout at your house, all right? Fight Camp comes with all the gear you need. They've got the best freestanding punchy bag available. Great quality boxing gloves, quick hand wraps, and they've got a unique punch tracking sensor system that shows you real-time progress and your stats on any iOS device. Now, once you have all the gear, you can choose from one of their six trainers who have real fight experience, and they're going to lead you through a 15, 30, or 45-minute workout structured like a boxing match. Three minutes of work and one minute of rest. What I like about that is the fact that, like, hey, you got only a short 15 minutes to get a workout in? Hey, no excuses. They've got you covered. You got a little bit more time? 30, 45. Fight Camp would be the perfect gift for anyone who wants to take their fitness to the next level. Or for someone who has maybe struggled finding a workout that keeps you excited, Fight Camp is a gift the entire family can enjoy and get competitive on. Hey, I'm actually going to get one of these myself because I've always wanted to get into boxing and kickboxing, but I've been a little intimidated about going into the gyms. So, hey... What better way than to do it in my own house, on my own time, whether it's a quick workout or a long workout, I think it's going to be fun. So Fight Camp wants to hook you guys up, all right? They're going to offer flexible financing. They've got as low as 0% APR and $0 down to get started. Right now, as a limited time holiday offer, they're going to give you guys free shipping and a gift valued up to $109 with every Fight Camp package. Just go to joinfightcamp.com slash TNQP. That's right. Get free shipping and a gift valued up to $109 with your purchase. Now bring that authentic boxing at Kickboxing Gym into your home with Fight Camp to get your your free gift just go to joinfightcamp.com slash tnqp joinfightcamp.com slash tnqp if we were to get into your never quit story or a never quit story because i would imagine there's more than one would it would you say it's in the military or in business i i would have said in business but you know last year you guys know i was doing the security contract and i was in haiti and we were mistaken for mercenaries that were there actually shooting some of those protesters. And so, you know, they see, you know, six white guys in a car and they thought that we were them. And at the time, the the president of the company, President Moise, was in some kind of like civil war battle with the prime minister. So the prime minister had us arrested and then we were held in that Haitian prison for four days until the State Department stepped in and, and rescued us. But... Um, what was that like? It was horrible, man. There's so there's no water in the cells. There's no sink. There's it's just concrete. It's they just, put you all in there together, or they yeah you yeah gym yeah. pop. The first night we were there, we there was only two cells. So the um, the first night we were there, we were I went into a cell with one guy, and you know you're like stepping on bikes. There's no lights. There's no electricity in them. It's just a fucking rusty ass cell with a master lock. And I was like, man, my God, dude, if I was assaulting this place, that door would come off in a second. And it was like, you, it sucks because you are trapped and now you are at the mercy of somebody else. You know, your passport's gone. And I mean, you just, that was the most isolated and I think like literally depressed I'd ever felt as, as far as like zero control. There's nothing you can do. You're just in there barefoot. You got pants on a shirt. And you know, all I was thinking about was like, man, this is just like Sears School. Fuck. This is kind of just like, except the box is bigger. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? So, so that's good news. Yeah. So it does work. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, it's just, you know, I just stayed calm and we were chill. The State Department came to visit with us and, you know, they figured out who we were when we told them. 
we did interviews with the local police, but there they have no electronics. They have no internet. So they're all handwriting shit. They're trying to, so imagine me talking through an interpreter speaking Creole to their friend who's just writing this shit down. And they're like, Hey, will you sign this? I'm like, absolutely not. I don't even know what the fuck that thing says, you know? Um, so we each got, you know, I call soft cell. We, they just talked to us. So we just like, we're chilling in the room. No, no big deal. But it was the no food, no water for the first couple of days until the state department snuck us some in and then really kind of just figuring out now what, you know, we're at the mercy of these people. So if we go to court and we're charged and they're like, Oh yeah, man, 30 years, you're going to a Haitian prison for 30 years and there's nothing you can do about it. You know? So that shit was terrifying to be honest with you. It's like, I, I, when I, when I finally got on that plane and flew out and I was, and I had my passport, dude, I had no, my fucking shoes with no laces in them still wearing the same shit I'd had on for a week on a commercial air flight going to Miami as lit as that thing took off and I was like tears streaming down my eyes. I was, I was rubbing that passport so hard. I thought I was going to set the fucker on fire. I was like, Oh God, America. <laughs> so, oh. I know exactly what that feels like. I don't understand. What do you mean? When, when you're, yeah, I what? mean, that fear. <laughs> yeah, dude. It, Holy that's shit. Unbelievable. Yeah. That's unbelievable. <laughs> so, and you know, but it's unique. It's, it's a like unique when you, when you, experience. It is. That is completely unique, right? When, when they pull all that stuff away from me and you're just kind of sitting there in your drawers, yeah. no shoes on. And you know, because you're there at the mercy of somebody else's, either their, how treacherous they want to be towards you or how nice they want to yeah, be towards generous. you. Yeah, generous. Yeah. You know? They That's treat y'all like shit or... The guards, were, the guards were cool to us. No one ever beat on us. No one ever did nothing like that. But I will say, whoever the fuck is teaching the Haitians how to put on handcuffs, guys... You don't have to do it that tight. <laughs> my fucking, the, my, yeah. the nerves in my hands, my two fingers, I didn't feel them for like almost three months when I, I got back. they're not built for comfort. <laughs> no, but those guys are like, oh. <laughs> Some bitches ain't built for comfort, man. Yeah. Well, they feel it against your skin and then they're like, okay, now let's crank it up even more. I mean, they instantly go numb, you, you know, blue. I gotta tell you, I don't think I've ever been comfortable with handcuffs. No, uh-uh. That's no. so if you somehow man, get out on dude, these bones right here. can't do yeah. nothing. Yeah, so. What kind of headspace were you in? Survival, just, you know, what do we need to say? What do we need to do? How can we communicate? Like, because we didn't even know the world even knew we were there. Didn't know that it became an international story. It was in all the papers. It was on Fox news and CNN. And when I, we landed in Miami, yeah, I borrowed a guy's phone that was sitting in my, in my aisle. And I say, Hey man, I just, I have nothing. I like, look, man, I don't even have laces in my shoes. He just looked at me. He was a black dude from Haiti. <laughs> and I was like, is there any way I could borrow your phone just to call my wife to let her know I'm alive? And he just looked at me. He's like, <laughs> his hands and over like, man, you, you got a rough, you got a rough day. <laughs> yeah. You look like absolute fucking bag of ass. So here you go. So I call my wife and I said, Hey, I'm really sorry if anybody's been calling you and you know, I'm really sorry. She goes calling me. She goes, Chris, you're on Fox news. You're on CNN. I'm like, I am. She goes, yeah, man. In handcuffs being let out of the jails and shit. Like she could see my tattoos and knew it was me. And yeah, it was cr- and then when I came home, I mean, how did I miss? It? I don't watch the news. Yeah, like, I had I had no idea that it was that big of a story, and then when I started googling my own name and all the stories, it was like next thing you know, we're we're robbing the bank in Haiti, the central bank in Haiti. That was a good one. That we were there to rob the central bank of Haiti, and that we had helicopters on the roof, and we were in a gunfight, and they captured us. It was, it was very Sounds strange. Sounds way cooler than what really happened. Yeah, it's probably good what, for morale. Was, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not getting this confused with the mercenaries that just went, that was Venezuela, right? Yeah. Okay. Now those guys are, those guys are fucked. They just got 20 years each. Oh, they did? Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. All right, I'm sorry, go ahead. So yeah, I mean, so when I came back from that trip about three weeks later, that's when my wife was, I was talking to you guys earlier about it, um, started slurring her speech and I took her to the hospital and she was diagnosed with uh, an autoimmune disease called my- myasthenia gravis and it's a uh, effects that like attacks your immune system from your shoulders up. So if it, at its worst, she can't talk, she can't hold her own head up, can't keep her eyes open, can't sit up. And that ended up, she ended up getting a, her thymus taken out, which is, you know, just shy of open heart surgery in my opinion. And then she went into what's called the myasthenic crisis where she crashed after that. And she was on a ventilator. Um, she had a pick line, four IVs, had a main line in her neck. In the, um, she, you know. And then before the ventilator though, we were in there in the hospital because I lived with her in the ICU for three months. And um, I would only go home just to basically you know, grab new clothes. And, three months? Yeah, I lived with her in the ICU for three months. And this was, I mean, shit, it was not even a year ago that this Did happened. Did she induce coma? When she 
when she flatlined, yes, that's when they put the her on a ventilator. So there was one night that we were in there. She's post surgery in the ICU. And I was getting her ready for bed. You know, I had the suction in her mouth and I was getting ready to like brush her teeth with like the little wisp or whatever, but she can't talk, right? And she's had a BiPAP machine on trying to force air. Yeah, yeah. And then she just was like looking at me and eyes rolled in the back of her head and she stopped breathing. And the fucking machine flatlined. So I started doing CPR on her. But as I put my hands on her chest, realized, holy shit, her sternum is still healing from the, from the surgery. So I can't do it because I'll kill her. So I was like, nurse, nurse. So the nurse comes running in. I grab the bag valve mask off the wall, right? And it's sitting in a bag, but I put it together. Like she's literally dying. Can't breathe. And I fucking assembled the mask, plugged it into the wall, fired the O2 up, put it on her. And the nurse was holding it as I started squeezing it. And the, and the, uh, the code blue alarm went off. And then there was like 30 people that rushed in there. And they took over from there. And then they put her in a coma and then put her on a ventilator. And that's what saved her life. So that is my never quit mode. I've never been through anything like that. Nothing I thought. I mean, buds, Haitian Marine prison. Corps, combat, Haitian prison. Nothing prepared me seeing my thriving wife, you know, living life normal to then being 90 pounds, almost dying, being on a ventilator. It was crazy. Absolutely insane. And she's made a full recovery, except she still has a disease. But, you know, we're working through that. And hopefully in a year or two, maybe it might start to go in remission. But, yeah. That's wild. Deep Damn, brain, yeah. It's That's fighter. terrible. Yeah, it's crazy. I remember when and you guys it. wanted to talk about matching knives. <laughs> what was the name? What was the name of the disease again? <laughs> Myasthenia gravis, and they call it the snowflake. the 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 symbol of it's a snowflake because each person's different symptoms and how it re- attacks the body is different. Damn. Were there any lasting effects from her flatlining that day? No. Mm-mm. Wow. No. And it's not hereditary. I mean, it, it, because it's not hereditary. It just it's an individual thing. Yeah. And the only reason we even knew that it happened is because her she started slurring her speech. Yeah. And that's when I took her to the doctor and found out what she had and took it from there. Man, it's been nuts. Yeah. Man, that's uh, that's a bit. You feel helpless, ideas. right? When your wife's hurting, man, you're standing yeah. there, you can't do nothing. You just yeah. Like that's the that worst. was really really difficult for me because you go from being you know, think about how many people give us the attention that we get, right? And they hear a Navy SEAL or whatever and, you know, oh my God, you're a hero, you're this, you're that. And I'm like, you want to know who's a hero? A registered nurse that saved my wife's life because I couldn't fucking do it. Like, you know what I mean? I, right. I, would, I only had so many skills, my combat medicine, like, okay, guy loses his leg. You're like, hey man, chill, bro. Let me just get your little turny, turny going. Yeah, you know? Yeah, combat, combat hero, but we're not in combat. We were correct. in this and that's... Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's not like it's a random Afghan villager that you're working with and you don't kind of give a fuck about. But then, you know, it's somebody that is near and dear to your heart. It's your soulmate. It's your, it's your, your family. It's the other half of your beating heart, so to speak. And there they are. And I couldn't do anything except what I knew how to react to do. You know what I mean? But I, you know, I didn't panic or nothing. I don't, I think back on it and she's like, she doesn't even remember it. She's like, yeah, I remember you brushed my teeth and the next day I woke up and I, had, I was on a ventilator. Is that bad, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Damn, man. So that was well, really, I'm glad she's doing well now. That's, yeah. And it's something when you see somebody trying as hard as you would to protect what it is that, that you can't help. Yeah. I got so stretches in the hospital. I, I get real attached to them. Like when to mm-hmm. you know, do stuff for them. And I mean, cause that's, that's a thing. A lot of hospitals you walk in, they, hospital care is one thing. Yes. Care, caring for somebody is completely different. Oh yeah. And that, that's what we kind of have here in, in our medicine is like they, they truly care about it. I you remember thinking my son was in man, ICU dude. when he, after he was born for two weeks. Yeah. And I remember I stayed in with him the whole time. Right. And I just remember seeing the same thing. I was like, here I have this skill set. I mean, my, my portfolio is vast and I am absolutely fucking helpless right now. Yeah. Yeah. That was an absolute feeling of helplessness. I was like, other man, than, this sucks. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I know exactly. And by the way, I want to thank you publicly because I know that I, well, actually it wasn't me. I just reposted a friend that did a, uh, a GoFundMe. I didn't even know they did it. And I just reposted on my Instagram. You posted it, donated money to us. So I appreciate that. And I think one of your Hollywood buddies gave us a shit ton of money because um, Mark Wahlberg liked the post and made a little comment. And then next thing you know, within like, I don't know, six hours, somebody had donated like $36,000 to us in one shot. So... 
That's awesome. Can't imagine it was one of my personal friends because I don't have anybody. <laughs> He's got just forty grand just loose in the bank that you know. Well, so. dude, I'm your personal friend, and I mean, it's there's there's so many good people out there that just <clears throat> look for yeah. something to do like that, and it's. Thank you for whoever. We don't know who did it. You know, so I have no that, idea who yeah, did it because it was an anonymous donation. So, and if, um, but yeah, for everybody that donated, I mean, I cannot thank you, thank him enough. I mean, it literally was the. I want to say that was probably my lowest point in life because I didn't give a fuck about work. I didn't care about my car. I didn't. I mean, I didn't give a shit about it. the house could have burned down. All I cared was about was seeing my wife get better. You know, and it's really really difficult being in that position because you know it's here we are how we are right and everything's fine and then you know think about 90 days later she can't even sit up in bed by herself can't open her eyes she can't lift her head up and she had to go through physical therapy just to to get the strength to even stand up on her own to now you know she's at the gym works out with me you know fucking filling ammo boxes and shipping shit out it's really cool man so it's it's, an, it's to me it's a miracle to me it's a, like a no shit modern day miracle for me anyway but when you watch them go through that and like you think seals are tough, just like you said, man. Yeah. The, the wives or or something. Yeah, I've been telling people like, man, we're not really the seals; they are. We just had to go through all that training to be able to stand next to them while they go through. All yeah, the, yeah. The, I mean, our you know that I mean the spark the the women that choose to be around us and choose to marry us are one. I think they're all insane. They're Spartan queens, man. It, it takes a very specific type of person to be able to deal with personalities like ours and then the experiences that we have and. You know, then we put pressure on ourselves as well as men because we have to live up to our own expectations and our own reputations and our own um, persona, yeah. persona. You know what I mean? So you always want to be the man of the house. You want to bring that shit. But I can assure you, my wife's five foot two and weighs 118 pounds, and I've never been more terrified of any other human being on this planet than that girl. <laughs> <laughs> man, hey, yeah, right. <laughs> It's like the weight of that Trident doesn't come on until after you get out. She would run over that fucking thing with the truck. Right? Like, who gives a shit? Whatever. I bought this for nine dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. Take the trash yeah. out. <laughs> what does it look like now? <laughs> so if you wear it, you ain't got no shirt. <laughs> yeah. So those are two pretty intense back to back experiences for you. A lot and it of, all and it all happened within like six months. Damn. People, I know a lot of our it's audience members would say, like, when you, yeah, right, when you, <laughs> when you're up against a challenge like that, like, how do you move? I wouldn't say move past it, right? But how do you, how do you push forward? I think just by being the positive light in somebody else's miserable experience, right? Because when she opens her eyes in the morning, I'm the one staring back at her, and if I'm shaken and I'm not confident and I am not there, I mean, there was times where. For a long time, for weeks, she couldn't even talk. So we had this little whiteboard that she would write on. And I remember one time I came in there and had a cup of coffee in my hand. And I didn't eat as, you know, for a couple of weeks I didn't eat. And her friends flew out because I, I was a fucking wreck because she couldn't eat. So I felt guilty for eating. So I never ate food in the room. I wouldn't drink nothing. I just sat there next to her. And, but there was one time she wrote down, she said, am I dying? And I was like, no, you're not dying. She's like, am I getting better or am I, she goes, Chris, I need to know the truth. Am I going to die? I'm like, dude, that is some really, really rough conversations yeah, with yeah. somebody who can't even talk. Yeah. You know, but you have to stay strong. You got to yeah. be that. Not on my watch. Yeah. You got to be that rock for that, for your, your people. You know what I mean? To me, that's what it's all about. You can't bail on people when it gets to be the hardest part of their life. People can bail on me during the hardest parts of my life, but we're some pretty hard motherfuckers, right? Mentally, physically, we can, we can, we have a tool bag that's pretty wide and deep that we can all tap into. Most people don't have that because they've never been through what we've been through. So their limitations and their mental stress or their quote unquote buds is like soccer when they were in high school sure, or, yeah, like, yeah. or, you know what I mean? Being on the lacrosse team or whatever, football, bait, you know, that's, they, they had to go that far back into like high school and shit for us. We're like, yeah, man, six years ago, there I was, you know, we have the capability to put up with a lot of shit. So if somebody left me, I wouldn't, you know, or if people bailed on me, I know that I will be okay. But for others in our lives, those that came into our lives that we fell in love with their families, they don't have that stuff, you know? And so the hundred percent, I believe depend on us to, be that strength you know what i mean and that was literally the weakest point that our family had ever been in 
was was that you know our kids are there and it's like oh my god you know what do I tell you know they're adult children you know yeah it's scary but so taking us fast forwarding us a little bit you sold tag I did in twenty in two thousand ten yeah which I guess that's taking us back to go forward but tell us a little bit about rugged. So, yeah, so I sold Tag in 2010, then I went to go work the company that I sold it to um, until they got sick of me and fired me. And at the time, I was obviously furious, but, you know, but the, looking back now, it was, it was probably one of the biggest favors anybody's ever done for me because, you know, when you're that close to something and you built it, you don't know, you know, how fucked up you really are, I guess. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's your best. apertures are very small. Yeah, yeah. You're, I'm looking through a microscope. They're looking through the Hubble telescope. That's basically the difference, right? <laughs> and they're like, hey, man, this is not for you. Get the fuck out of here. So they fired me. And that was a tough pill to swallow. But with Rugged, though, you know, we moved out to Las Vegas. We actually share the wall with Floyd Mayweather's gym, which is pretty fun. Oh, that's cool. That's that. legit. Yeah, they're cool, man. Oh, of course, man. That's, yeah, dude. that's how we. That's how I Great, ended up yeah. out there. Because I'm a big boxing fan, right? And I'm my a huge wife, Mayweather fan. Yeah, and my wife and I were visiting my parents. They live in Vegas. Call him up. And right I said, <laughs> and I, fucking, I was like, hey, I've never been to Mayweather's gym. I want to swing by, just take a look at it, just see where it's at. Because you, know, you see it on all the Showtime specials and the, and the old HBO um, oh, sports. So good, and, man. So we went there and rolled down the window. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. She took a picture and we drove away. That was it. Because it was all closed due to COVID. And so I get to my parents' house and I looked at the picture. And next door to them is a real estate office. Had a, you know the number on there. So I called them up. I go, hey, man, how much does it cost for you know, rent out here because I'm from San Diego. I've been there my whole life. So that shit's astronomical there, as, as we all know. So the lady tells me what the price per square foot is. And I was like, hmm. It's like, can you guys, you got any spots available? And she's like, yeah. So she sends me a, a link. And there was no bullshit. The one right next door to Floyd Mass shares the wall with him. I was like, cool, man, I'll take it. Send me the lease agreement. Hung the phone up. I'm like, hey, babe, we're moving to Las Vegas. She goes, what? I was like, yeah, we're going to move to Las Vegas. She goes, when? I'm like, uh, got to be there in three weeks. <laughs> you got to be next to Floyd. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how it happened. It went down just that fast, too. And Because I'm very impulsive like that. I'll, you know, I, was I don't the have bit, was, was Rugged up and running already or was just... Rugged was up and running, but it was in my garage. And hmm. I all the lessons I'd learned from business from TAG and from LC Industries, you know, because, you know, TAG was doing like $5 million a year in sales, right? And so in the 10 years I had, I was like somewhere between 50 and 60 million bucks in gear that I had sold. Then I go to a company that they're doing 250 million a year. You know what I mean? It's, a, it's just astronomical, you know, 700 employees, their, their distribution center is 130,000 square feet. It's just retarded how big some of these businesses are, you know what I mean? And so going from all that bullshit, and then it got fired. I was like, you know, I never want to have a business like that again. I don't want to have the building. I don't want to have the employees. I don't want to have all the overhead. And, you know, that. so I went into a business model of I will find an OEM, an other equipment manufacturer, somebody who makes the shit for you. So I would find OEMs to just make my product and I would just market it and sell You're a it. distributor? Yeah. As opposed to having, because so I don't have a dealer network anymore, no distributors. I refuse to do all that. So it's just a direct to consumer brand. And, you know, we try to keep the, the prices as low as humanly possible. You know, and I give you an example. Say, like our two point sling is 30 bucks, whereas the average competitor is probably right around 60 to $80, depending on, on who you're buying it from. But it's made with the same stuff, you know, the same nylon, the same hardware. There's, there's no magic in nylon. Sure. So that's why I'm kind of getting bored with it because there's nothing, it doesn't, I've been in that game for so long that, there's nothing exciting about it anymore, you know? Well, that's one part. When they grow that big like that, then people expect that, that product to look a certain way and to, to be a certain way. And right. They, which isn't to mean that the guy out in, the, in his garage, he's actually making that same thing but modifying it. Right. Better to, to when the next gen comes in. Yeah. Right. And and so what you do, that's kind of... And that's, that's one of the other problems with, with a bigger business or business in general is people believe at the, at the helm of any company because it's all based off of gross sales and incentivizing people with um, commissions or year-end bonuses or vacations somewhere. That's, that's really what kind of incentivizes people or vacation times and titles and stuff like that. Because, you know, most people in regular day-to-day -day business aren't like us. They don't, they've never done something that you can't pay for. That's why I believe so many people love us and respect us is because they know we did something that they cannot buy. 
Mm. So it doesn't matter how much money you got. You can't be a Navy SEAL. You have to go down there and put the you fucking can't, work You can't in. pay to be one. Yeah. You, that's, you a good, I've never, that's a good, yeah. solid perspective, Chris. I, I never thought of it that way. That's yeah. Great. But anybody can join wow, the Navy. Wow, man. That's good. That was deep. <laughs> so deep. That, that was deep. deep. So deep. Deep. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So when I look at stuff like that and the whole business world, it can't last forever. You can't just keep selling and selling and selling. It can't have year over year over year over year of growth with a year over year increase in net margin. You know what I mean? In profitability. So people look at Amazon, obviously Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world now, most successful company next to Apple. But when he started all that, he was borrowing money for the first, I think, 12 or 13 years. They'd never made a fucking profit. Oh, that, that picture takes of him at his desk of, with Amazon on butcher paper behind him mm -hmm. is just like seared right here. Yeah. That's well, like the greatest yeah. story ever. Yeah. So I've just never pictured myself being a guy like that. When I, because all I wanted to be was a frog man. You know what I mean? I told you this as a kid, but I fucked up in, in school and did drugs and got in a fight. So I, you know, so my whole goal in life was only to be a Navy SEAL. That's all I wanted to do. Then I did it, and then I got bit by the entrepreneurial bug. And then once I had sold the business and then worked in a real company, in a real corporate, because my company wasn't real. <laughs> you know what I mean? OSHA, probably I should be in prison. Like if OSHA would have came by, I'm surprised I'm not in jail. But a real business, man, they have like rules, OSHA You've compliance, been in a Haitian manuals. prison, so that kind of like. It was about the same. Uh, yeah. About the same. But you know, you're under a lot of constraints and it's boring because you got to follow the rules and HR and this and that. You can't cuss. You can't this, you can't that. It's, it's, it fucking sucks. Regular business world fucking sucks. <laughs> and so what I learned from that experience is that I never, ever, no matter what, no matter how much money somebody would pay me, I never would put myself back in that position. So today, my only goal is to never work for somebody else ever again, another day in my life. That's it. So if that takes $10 a month, or a million dollars a month, that's what I'm gonna do. All right guys, time to show some love to another sponsor. These guys, they've been taking care of us for a while, Lightstream. Hey listen, holidays are coming up. It's time to erase some credit card bills, all right? The credit card consolidation loan from our friends at Lightstream can help you mark them paid in full. And that's because Lightstream believes that people with good credit deserve a better loan experience and that's exactly what they're gonna deliver you guys, all right? You can quickly roll balances from multiple credit cards, Maybe you've been racking them up throughout the year trying to get Christmas gifts ready for people. They're going to put it all into one single monthly loan payment. They're going to give you guys a low fixed interest rate, free up more money in your monthly budget because you're going to be saving that, all right? Say goodbye to credit card bills. Take even more control of your money. Lightstream's credit card consolidation loans have rates from just 5.95% APR with auto pay, and there are absolutely no fees. You can't find that many places. And Lightstream wants to take care of you guys today, so they're going to give you guys an additional interest rate discount to save even more. But the only way to get it is to go to our special link, okay? Our special link is lightstream.com slash TNQ. That's lightstream.com slash TNQ. They're going to hook you guys up with an additional discount. That's L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash TNQ. Subject to credit approval, rate includes 0.50% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash TNQ for more information. Did you ever feel like it was going to work when we, were, when we were in? Never. No. Not one day, right? No. How about you, T? Not ever, right? I never felt like that either. No. And people asked me what a normal day for us was. I was like, every day is different. Every single day. I mean, when you would walk in, this morning, you would look, I mean, we don't need to read the, the comics or newspaper. You just wait. Like, tell me what happened last night. Yeah. Because us just going home is an adventure. And then getting back to work is another one. Yep. And because there's so much diversity in our ranks with the age and stuff like that, man, sure. it's just like, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I still can't. And no matter when we talk about those hard times and stuff we went through, man, it was worth it just to hang out with them dudes. Yeah. hundred percent. I like would I, go through buds three times. Just, just to hang out with them guys. Just to hang out. Because think about the, the people that you meet from all over the place and the caliber of personalities so and just, man. and everything's a, everything is a battle nothing is easy not everybody wants to race it's like man can't we just it's like chill? one guy it's from like, each walk of life in this not. country is what you have like one guy from each kind of what walk of life we have around here yeah. in the alpha form right you throw them into one fraternity yep that's that sixth graders with guns that was the funniest thing i ever heard when they called us i was like that's that's about right because whatever age you are when you go in that's how that's when you stop that's and where the mental development stops, right? Yeah, they, 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 they turn you into a seal. That's yeah, why it's yeah. so hard for guys when we get out, because when we get out, man, we're 23 years old. That's right. Or 17 or 18. 
Yeah. It's like you have to go back through the pipeline just to understand what in the hell happened to us. Yeah, think about going through, well, joining the Navy, going to Buds, SQT, get your bird, jump wings, you check into a platoon, and you're like, hey, I got an idea. And they're like, you do, huh? Shut the <laughs> fuck up. Yeah. And they beat your ass, and you get hazed, and you're like, oh, so no ideas? They're like, no. no. Remember the thing, everybody's got a voice? It's yeah. not really true. No bird, no word. And then it was one platoon <laughs> wonder, two pump chump. I mean, you literally yeah. had to run the, before you, where anybody wanted to hear anything do it. And when they say beat your ass, I mean like, over the freaking berm, beat your ass. If you were lucky, it was a normal ass whooping. Dude, some of the stuff they come up and be like. The hazings back in the day were brutal. Brutal, man. Man. I got hazed a couple of times for fucking up, but I think everybody does. But yeah, yeah, yeah of course. We call them hazing. They're uh, not yelling. Ca- motive, attitude adjustment. Motivating. Character building days. Ooh, character building. Character building. Nice. Yeah. So was I the mean, lack of excitement in the nylon the transition into ammo? Yeah. Well, the transition into ammunition happened when we moved to Las Vegas. There's a huge range out there, the the Clark County Shooting Complex. It's like 2,500 acres. It's out in the desert. It's massive. So I went up there to ask them about renting the range to like do pistol class. And they said, oh, you got to have this license, that led more licenses, right? So I spent a few months getting all the licenses and all the bullshit so I could be, you know, rent the range out and do whatever I wanted to do. But in that, I wanted to have ammo because part of the experience with shooting courses is you show up and they're typically 500 bucks to 650 bucks, depending on who it is. And that's all it is. They're just like, Hey man, show up. And they don't even give you sunscreen. Fuck. And can you believe that? I, it's unbelievable, man. <laughs> Say it's in the desert too, right? Yeah. Well, and I, and I thought For all about intents it. Purposes, the whole, the whole state's desert, right? No, yeah. Okay. Just trying to say, yeah. So no sunscreen, but when you think about the training and the shit that we went through, I think part of what made us so good is that we didn't have to do that much. Because if you were a new guy, you were getting the sandwiches for the dudes. You were already breaking the ammo down. It was in the cans. Demo was being prepped, right? Guns were, you know, shit was dialed. You know, if you were the hook and climb guy, heaven for fucking bid, your shit wasn't dialed in on the day we were doing VBSS, right? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Because that's when you're a shit bag is when you're supposed to come up to do your deal and you, and it's not ready. Yeah, Otherwise. the one time they're like, and action. <laughs> and you're like, oh and shit, my bad. And there's no go. And there's no back to one. It's not like being on a movie and you're like, and back to one. Hey, turn the boat around. Let's try the assault and, again. Yeah, and the motor doesn't That start. is yeah. Goddamn motor funny, not dude. Yeah. That is funny. four million dollars to throw seventeen dudes out of the back of the plane, and we're depending on one dude yeah. who fucked up and got salt water in the fucking gas line. You're like, yeah, yeah. Oh, and they're like, why? why and you're just happening? out there, and everybody's getting seasick. And you're like, really, Bob? That's that's yeah. what we're doing now. We give that we're job job to, to the new back, guy. You're fucking done dude. to the new guy. And, and it's like, hey, what? You ask him what wrong, and he'll give you every line in the book. Besides, look, I was freaking terrified to jump out of the airplane at night into the water. First time I've ever done it. Everyone's yelling at me. I didn't know what to do. That's the last line they'll throw out. Right. Everything else went wrong in between. He's like, no, I was gripping that thing so tight it tore the damn, <laughs> <laughs> tore, tore the dry bag because I knew that shoe would open. Yeah. They're like rig for toe. And you're like, oh, this will be awesome. Great. Yeah. Toe into cool. where? Nice. I mean, yeah, dude, that's what I'm saying. Out there when that, when we catch those submarines, just out there, just us floating in the water hooked to a, a rope and a freaking nuclear submarine runs in between you. And you're like, this is how we getting in. They're like you're in the middle of it right now. This yeah. is how we get in. We swimming. We're swimming it. <laughs> mm. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I was like, is this for real? I mean, cause that was something out of the, what you saw in the movies. Right. And we were watching Navy SEALs the other day. And uh, that scene where they lock out a submarine and they chase the boat down the VBSS, mm-hmm. something like that. That was that was the stuff that recruited us. I was like, that looks so sexy and so cool. But the, when you have I mean, to when do you, it, when you watch in real that life, movie and see Charlie Sheen and Michael being hanging on the side of a fucking oil tanker, dude, and they climb up on the ship's, you're like, bro, that was the coolest thing I ever saw. <laughs> uh, when does that happen? Coolest thing yeah. I ever saw. It was, it was the yeah. most miserable thing I ever had to do. I think Michael, <laughs> being the actor, probably has more SEAL platoons at this point. Than he I does. Think. He does. Yeah. He Those guys should I, be able to go into the absolutely. into the reunions for for nothing. Definitely yeah. has more kills than most of us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when I was looking at what I wanted to do different, right, than the other pistol classes, like you know what, man, man, I'll just supply the ammo. I'll give them eye pro ear pro so everybody has their shit so when they show up they all i gotta do is shoot bring your gun your holster your belt and your mag pouch and we will take care of everything else and in that quest to get all that stuff lined up for the students that's when i was talking to my dad because he's in the he's in the gun game and he builds 1911s so does my brother and they were like hey man why don't you just buy your ammo from our loader instead of buying them from us. And I was like, what are you talking about? So I go and visit this, this, uh, this manufacturer 
saw everything he had and I bought 30,000 rounds. I was going to, you know, get 12,000 or 15,000 for myself and then have some extras. And I took a picture of it and threw it up on Instagram. Say, hey guys, I got 30,000 rounds of nine mil and some two, two, three. If anybody needs some, let me know. I got some extra ammo. And I had no idea. I mean, I had no bullshit. Had no idea there was an ammo shortage because I get my bullets for free. And you know, it's, I've never really paid for ammo, <laughs> you know? And so when I sold all that ammo, then I called the guy back up and go, Hey man, can I buy a, a hundred thousand rounds? He's like, sure. So I get a hundred thousand rounds and I sold that in three days. And so yeah, less uh, probably in a week and a half, two weeks, I sold close to 200,000 rounds of ammo. And so now that's what I'm literally doing. I mean, I just shipped out yesterday before I came did you, here. I did you bring 50. us any? I'll ship some to you. Okay. I didn't want to fly with it. So great answer. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's heavy. So yeah. So it's, 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 yeah, it's yeah. in the mail. It's in, it's yeah. kind of, it's in the mail. What are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. So, you know, so now I'm doing nine millimeter, 45, 40 cal, trying to get my hands on 380. And got 300 blackout coming, 308, 223, green tip. But the reason why ammo is so fucking expensive now is because there's no primers anywhere in the world. The prime, there, There's like a crazy primer shortage. Remington went out of business. I don't know if you guys know that, but Remington. I they, I got they got bought, bought out. sold, right? Not yet. They claim bankruptcy and no one's bought them yet. Really? Yep. Glock was having such a problem because they couldn't manufacture guns because the factories were closed. That Glock moved out of the United States. They closed their factory in the United States about three months ago. What? Yeah, that's all right. I don't like Glock anyway. <laughs> yeah, so they're going back to wherever, whence, gun, whence they came, rolling over. and then they're going to crank <laughs> up manufacturing again. Well, man, this is crazy. I, don't, I know too much about ammo and shit. But I so, hope so. You're in the business. Yeah. So ATK which is a multi-billion dollar company, was bought out by Northrop Grumman. ATK had the contract to run the Lake City Arsenal plants, which made all the small arms for the military, right? So Northrop Grumman bought ATK, and then it was the contract was recompeted. So Winchester just won that contract about 60 days ago, something like that. So Winchester stopped making ammunition for the civilian world. So the, all the light white box with the red, they call it, yeah. you know, yeah. the red, they call it white box, box, red box yeah. says Winchester. They're not making any ammo right now. They're only making ammo for the U.S. military because they, when they jumped in there, they were like six or seven months back ordered on government contracts already. So no one is making bullets. You know what I mean? So by just pure luck, fucking teams and shit, that family friend of ours is making ammo so you know i'm making i mean i'm getting like a hundred thousand rounds a week right now so what and my goal primers? my goal is to take this up to a million rounds a month so that'd be 12 million rounds a year and i probably will just pivot naturally out of nylon and just do bullets and training now you're gonna, you just said you don't want to grow it into something huge again you're going to do that with that yeah, but it won't be that big. I'll, st I'll still stay in the same <laughs> shop. And, Team guy. Yeah. Yeah, you know. We'll see it won't happens. be that big. Only 200 plays. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, but it's a but it's a pennies game, right? So, I mean, you only, I only mark the, the bullets up a few cents. Sure. You what's what's the deal with the primers? I don't know. I don't know why the there's a primer shortage, but there's obviously larger primers, and then there's small pistol primers, and the yeah. small pistol primers are obviously what's used for like 380 and 9mm and, and all that. So, And then COVID happened. So the riots start kicking off, right? And people who were vehemently opposed to even owning a gun now own a shitload of guns. Oh, yeah. And I've heard that, too. Yeah, so more than, I want to say, six or seven million guns have been sold to new gun owners in the and last And people are like complaining because of all the rules there are to get a gun. That's right. I've heard that, too. Yeah, the people true? in California bitching. Bit, uh, they, they voted for that shit, and, and now they're butthurt. They got to stand in line. Because it's hard to get a gun. Very hard. Yeah, yeah very hard to get it. Um, of course. And so now, you know, they are shooting and they're trying to learn how to shoot even, even the indoor gun ranges. Like you go to Las Vegas, a lot of them are probably going to close because they only make money off of range fees and selling bullets. Some of those companies charge a tourist a dollar fifty a bullet. That's for a nine mil. So you go in there like, hey, bro, I want to shoot a Glock at a zombie target. No problem, man. $25 for the gun range. Oh, you've never shot before? Well, you got to have an instructor in there. That, then you got to pay for that person. The target's two dollars for your cool ass zombie target, and then they take in there with a Glock or a Sig or an HK, whatever the fuck it is. But they're charging you a dollar fifty a bullet, like seventy five bucks a, a case. And an you're in there doing rap, game, and you're man. in there doing rapid fire and shit. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it's cool, right? But they have no bullets to sell to the customers, so there are literally 
hundreds of ranges across the country that are that are closing permanently because they cannot get bullets. God, is that hilarious? Is that because that used to be where you could go to shoot an automatic weapon? Is that why? Because each bullet was so so expensive. It was like, there, man, that's, yeah. So <laughs> so bucks, hundred bucks. Man. So a ten, So if you went to shoot like a saw, a ten round belt is a hundred bucks in Vegas. If you shoot a fifty cal, it is is it twenty five dollars? I think it's twenty five or thirty dollars a round to shoot a 50 cal shit that we would like oh my god we got to carry this back hey bros anybody want to can a fucking 50 cal right no push it over the side of the boat yeah i ain't i ain't fucking counting this shit we throw it over the side of the boat dudes are paying fucking 30 Nothing. 40 dollars a round for it's time shit. to go some dude some diving <laughs> <laughs> Davy Jones, that was the real navy jones yeah, locker yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. oh my gosh so are you going to try to meet that demand too is try to start supporting some of the like the ranges with ammo well, I've been to a few of them and they all say the same thing. Hey man, we can't buy it for what you sell it for because how do we make money? And I'm like, well, I'm selling it to you for 57 cents of round and you're charging a dollar fifty. That's not enough margin for you. Yeah, it's pretty the good. Fuck world are you living in, bro? Yeah. Do you want to keep charging range fees? You're going to need ammo. So right. that's how you're yeah. making money. Yeah. But it's, it's the sticker shock that's going on right now in, in the, in the world. And, um, so most people go to like ammo which is the largest online shopping site for ammunition and i just ended up getting listed on that but that's where you can go and you can literally compare and you can single out hey i want 50 rounds 500 rounds a thousand rounds you want brass case steel case you want this that and you kind of like you know so brand you, new remanufactured do you like door-to-door -door cold call people like hey just in the neighborhood one of you need some rounds for your pistol I, I probably could at this point you could probably go you probably could this shit like the ice cream truck but with a with yeah yeah full, but, full of bullets ding, ding, ding. It's, a big, it's a big bullet oh, on the, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. just playing the national anthem and cruise like oh shit that's the rugged bullet truck yeah. Fuck me. Oh, what do we need honey yeah, he's got he's got a, he's got a truck full of freedom seeds what is that holy shit <laughs> they got a discount not real <laughs> What's the special today? Yeah. <laughs> Let me get some of that out. Uh, and uh, kid wants a nine mil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know you got some fifty cows like under that. the seat. Come oh on. Oh my god. Like those That's so funny. funny. Right? Mom, Mom hurry! I'm not gonna Mom. make it. Dude. Yeah. yeah. That's so, great. Yeah. But what's but what's interesting if you think back 2015, which wasn't that long ago. I mean, a thousand rounds of nine mil was 120 bucks. You now couldn't you can't even get 22, bucks. right? Can't even 22 long rifle. No, because it's a um, it was impossible to get rim fired, so the the brass doesn't. It's not out there. It's just not non existent. Are are you making remanufactured? It's remand, yes. Yeah. So it's once fired brass, CCI primers, uh, full metal jacket. Um, we call them they call them projos for the projectile. I just call it a fucking bullet, but <laughs> um, so yeah. So it's full metal jacket, and you know, no match grade stuff. No, it's all target, right? Yeah. How many times can you recycle that? I guess each time, right? You bring Ours is only once fired. Some people go two to three times, but then at that point, it's it's too overly used. And then when it when it actually fires, the brass casing expands too much, and that's why you have. Well, that's what I'm talking about. So after that, happens, what do you do with that brass? That just stays in the dirt. I don't. I don't. Fuck can't that collect much. all that and melt that down. I I'm not in that world. No. Can't melt. Somebody could. Not melt it down, but I mean, re well, if you put enough yeah. of it together. I think it'd be. Well, cheap. I said something like it was impossible to do, <laughs> yeah. man. Uh, he's I mean, laughing about it. He's having a good time. Uh, he's What's having hey, a good how time. Yeah. <laughs> how about you, sideburns? Do you want some of this milk? I just noticed how uh, deep it gray in your beard. I know no, it's always been there. That is amazing. I put it. it is, I'm afraid to grow mine out. One, because it's patchy and it's red. I don't know why. I have you a Joe Dirt in it? What's that? You got a Joe Dirt going on? Yeah, it's kind of patchy, and then one time I grew it out, and it was kind of like a reddish brown. Like, oh, like Embrit? Freaking, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're just, a redhead? No, I'm. my hair is brown, but when that beard came out, it looked reddish brown. Like So your drapes are brown? Weird. Yeah, and I just, <laughs> uh, I'm going to stick brown. to the hot water and razor thing. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> yeah. How long you been growing it? That, tea, yeah, that thing looks good, man. That bad boy. Three, four months before I got out of the teens, I started growing it. Yeah. Oh, okay. But I've trimmed it a lot since then. Yeah. Is it a pain in the ass to put that mask on? Yeah. Well, I kind of, I get the really loose one, so it just kind of sits, sits there. Sits there. But it's more of a pain in the ass when I'm like shooting, like trap, I'll shoulder the gun and it'll, I'll pinch my beard and when I get it, it rips it out. Oh, wow. Remember the, uh, the Velcro and the body armor when your beard get kick? <laughs> what phase is that called? When that's like, it's right, man, that was some brutal. You either shave it or stick it out. Yeah. Well, Chris, you know, we could talk to you all night man so uh and we're gonna you just gotta quit, yeah right yeah I, but no i'm good I'm, <laughs> I'm not going anywhere uh do you want to tell people where they can find you how they can support you all that fun stuff 
Yeah, so uh, Instagram, if you want to follow the memes, which I don't know how I became a meme how king. How did you become the meme king? I, dude, I don't know. I, I literally, I mean, I'm on Instagram a couple hours a day because it's how I promote the, the brand and the business. I just started seeing other people's memes and shit, and I would just find videos, and I just thought it was hilarious. I just started posting them, and then my followership went up by like 10 or 15,000 because people were like, I'm here for the memes. Where do you... Where's the meme discovery site? Reddit? There, no, no, no. I don't, I, I've never been on Reddit. I don't fuck around with that. Um, so I will, I comb the, the interwebs or the gram looking for some. There's a couple of accounts that I follow, but a lot of people send them to me or it's just random shit that, you know, Some of the stuff that you share, jumps up man, in the it's feed, just yeah. gold. Yeah. I mean, pe people's humor is unbelievable. Oh, man, I love... When, when they develop that stuff. Yeah. I mean, think about it. The world is literally collapsing around us so to speak even though we can still go to starbucks i find that odd that we're in a pandemic but i can still go to starbucks so how big of a pandemic is it really but but in all that chaos you know america stays true to being americans and that's just we just are savages we're weird man we make fun of fucking humor everything. and calamity i mean when yes. it starts getting hard our humor comes out and that's how we survive yeah exactly right so i just thought that shit was funny and it was entertaining to me the people started following me for that and you know but it's rugged underscore and it's r-h-u-g-e-d or you can call me on my cell phone if you want to buy bullets 619-210-5956 you're gonna get some calls my friend yeah. i doubt it i doubt it does anybody got leave me listen to this thing no no it's for tape feels like, like i'm recording people. it just for you guys a like couple people just us me followers. my girlfriend what's, yeah, what is, what, what's your um instagram rugged underscore so it's r-h-u-g-e-d that's not how you spell rugged should we well, have so, everybody in the so play? So it's R, just remember this, R huge D. <laughs> remember, but I'm a white guy. I'll so never forget lie. that anymore. It's a lie. So hey, there was an underscore in there I heard. There's an underscore. There is? Yeah. Where's it? At the end. Rugged underscore. Oh. Got yeah. it. it wasn't available without the underscore, huh? It was not. Somebody had already stolen that for some strange reason. And if we could do something to help the missus or anything in that front, whatever. I mean, thank every, you. You bet, man. I'll let you know, man. She's doing really well, man. <clears throat> she couldn't make it out right now t to here because the uh, the her uh, neurologist gave her the thumbs down to travel because she's on a lot of immunosuppressants and things like that, and it's just not next safe. time. We'll Better sit, yeah, for sure. Now that you got to lay the land. It's just like a you know your yeah. add on recon. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, thanks you guys for listening to this episode of the show. Let us know what you think. Leave us a review on iTunes. Share the episode with a friend. You can follow us on social media. You can go to teamneverquit.com slash social to access all of our social links. If you'd like to get some of the bonus content, head over to patreon.com slash teamneverquit. Chris, thanks again, man, Never for joining quit. us. It's my pleasure. Thank you, guys. Later. This is the Team Never Quit Podcast. Podcast. So buckle up, buttercup. <laughs> <laughs>